Rock. The Rock Pile Report. The pettiest, hardest drinking Bills podcast. Welcome, everybody, to another edition of the Rock Pile Report podcast. I'm your host, Bill, season ticket holder, Drew Gear. That's my producer, Chris Krueger. And we're here talking about the first week of Buffalo Bills training camp. <sighs> Isn't it nice to have real, tangible football things to talk about and not just a bunch of, I don't even know what you want to call it. What about ism is a little strong. I think so much of the NFL like preseason process before camp starts is just postulations. You're talking about, you're stuck talking about hypotheticals. That, and we're going to, we, I actually have a really specific example of some of those that we'll get to in just a few minutes, but just all of these things that you think, like you're Schrodinger's football team. Oh, we have these players who might do X and we have this new coach who might do this and might bring in these new ideas. And it's cool. And on paper, you have all these thoughts and all these things that your team could be. <clears throat> and for about 20 teams, Chris, I think this is probably a fair estimate, 20 fan bases, you know, if we're using the Schrodinger analogy, opened up the box to find out, you know, this week that, hey, my my team, really not that different. Hey, the things that I thought were going to be really cool, they might kind of suck. Or it's just too soon to know whether or not my team is going to be better than it was last year. Is it fair to say about 20 out of the 32 NFL teams are living that right now? I mean, I'm ready to break down Keon Coleman, the greatest wide receiver <laughs> we've ever seen, because he made one nice catch inbounds against his own team. Or are all the people before s- pads come on? Or all the people screaming about Javon? Not screaming, but complaining is what I'll call it about Javon Baker, wide receiver who I in the draft process I had a lot of interest in. Javon Baker, some solid little career for himself. Seems like a versatile piece. Can maybe make some plays at the NFL level. Someone the Bills should kick the tires on later in the draft. And then watch them just like have multiple cracks at it and not draft him. And then to see him like doing good things for the Patriots in training camp. And to know that there's people out there acting like we made some kind of grand mistake, it's like, you do know he could still suck. There is still a universe in which once guys start hitting and real football starts, it's entirely possible Javon Baker's a nobody. But today, you have people thrilled about it, if you're a Patriots fan, and people who are Bills fans who are all in their feelings about, we missed this opportunity. Do you know that? We still don't know a ton. What we have is one week. But I'll say this. For one week of actual football players doing football things, Chris, I'll raise a glass and toast to it because it has been a long summer. Ooh, for those of you on audio, this looks like a whiskey cocktail. I'm assuming it's an old fashioned. No. Ooh. Hmm. It's not, it's not as complicated as your usual ones, and there's a little bit of bitterness on the back end, so I'm curious. What did you do with this? Uh, it's called a Monte Carlo. I will have it at one of the tailgates. That's for fucking sure. Well, I was, I'm, I'm laughing because I drove not one, but two different Monte Carlos. I had a 1996 Monte Carlo. I had a 2001 Monte Carlo. And then, and for those of you who don't know, I am half Puerto Rican. I was sitting around with my... I was sitting around with my cousins having a conversation like in my early 20s and I made a comment to them because there was like another group of Hispanic gentlemen who came driving by in like, Chris, I'm not kidding, like a low rider with like a giant Mexican flag thing hanging from the rear view mirror and like it was the car from Cheech and John up in smoke. Like it was that car and I was like, it's kind of funny when people just pick like stereotypical vehicles, you know, it's kind of funny when that happens. And all of my cousins turned and looked, they do that slow turn, like, like someone just said the craziest thing they ever heard. And they go, Drew, you drive a Monte Carlo. And I was like, oh, no, <laughs> oh, no, they've got me. I'm, I'm an offender as well. <laughs> yeah, uh, Monte Carlo is like a riff on uh, a Manhattan. So it's a uh, two ounces of rye, a half ounce of Benedictine and Angostura bitters. Benedictine? So what is that? It's like a 
It's like a more floral, like sweet vermouth. That's what I'm tasting then. That's it's interesting. I'm gonna make a batch of it for a tailgate. That's, That's really for damn good. Sure. Well, Chris, cheers. Toast to the Buffalo Bills. Back, back real, throwing footballs around. Real football. Real football things are happening, folks. Now, quick, we got a lot of ground to cover tonight. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit you guys with lightning round style because it can't all be sunshine and rainbows. I'm going to get all my detritus out as fast as I possibly can. I'm going to start with the Mike Edwards injury. Okay. Uh, Detritus, bad news. We're going to get it all out now. Mike Edwards injury is a hamstring and he's week to week. Now, that's it's frustrating, I guess, because he's a player who, Chris, if you want to Google this and fact check me, I know that he wasn't available. If you go to Pro Football Reference and look at how many games he started over the last year or two and how many games he's been available for. He was injured for most of the preseason process, couldn't participate in minicamp or anything like that. But that was with a completely different injury. Now he's going to miss significant time in training camp because of a hamstring injury at a position where I feel like, as we're going to talk about later, we have a lot of bodies here. We have a lot of guys who are capable of potentially coming in and anchoring positions here on our roster. Now, looking at this, Chris, going back to 2019, Mike Edwards has what last year was the first full season he's ever played in his career. Before that, he has 13 games played in 2022, 14 in 2021. It's not great. And I know that there was nagging injuries kind of in there in some of those seasons. So I don't, it's maybe not enough to call him injury prone, but it's frustrating that as far as his Bills career goes, he's missed significant parts of the install when it comes to understanding what it is we ask our safeties to do. And to be a, to start to fundamentally understand how it is we rotate because it, it's all over Twitter. The way their safeties, are, just even through this early part of training camp, have been incredibly active in pre snap and post, you know, pre snap and post snap motion and the way that they rotate them. And so he's missing a ton. He's already missed a ton. Now he's missing live reps. I don't know that it costs him a roster spot, but it definitely prob probably, if other guys continue to step up, could cost him a spot at a, spot at a starting job, right? I'm going to have to fight Kyle Trimble. You Why? see that on the screen? <laughs> I'm, I am on. <laughs> Bangedupbills.com is banged up. Art, yeah, there's an article available. Injury <laughs> analysis, Mike Edwards. So I'm sure Kyle broke down his complete injury history, and it would be useful for this conversation we're having <laughs> right now. But if you go to Banged Up Bill's Mike Edwards injury analysis, this is from March of 24, the site is currently undergoing scheduled maintenance. Please try again soon. It's weird when you think about the internet, and this is how spoiled we've become. Like, this is nothing Kyle did wrong. BangedUpBills.com rules, and you should all be going there for your injury analysis news. But... It's hilarious that this is considered an in like this has inconvenienced me. You want to talk about first world problems? This website that would give me all of the information on a topic I'm interested in within a couple clicks of a button. Oh, what do you mean I have to wait to access that? <laughs> it's like that Louis C.K. bit when he's like people complaining about how their phone is too slow. Yeah. How the Internet. He goes, the information goes to space. Yeah. It, it goes to space. And Give it, it goes a second. To a satellite, and then it comes back from space back to your pocket. This all goes on, and yet it's not going fast enough for you. Your phone isn't shit, your shit. <laughs> it's first world problems, but either way, Mike Edwards. I just think that the injury couldn't come at a worse time for him because he needed to make up for his lack of a preseason process and minicamp and all these other things. Because he might have the playbook. He might understand it. He might be a savant. He picks it up and goes, I know where I'm supposed to be. I know the timing of all these things. I understand, like, at this point in the pre-snap, we do this because I've watched film. But if you don't do it and you don't look at your teammates and understand how they do what they do and how you all kind of act interchangeably to make, make up the whole of what is your pre-snap shift, you don't know how to execute it. I think that this injury could potentially set him back 
significantly in his bid to get a starting job on the roster. We'll have to see if anybody else steps up and grabs the opportunity while he's out. Another guy who needs to do something is Lyle Collins. Chris, veteran offensive lineman, last played with the with the Cincinnati Bengals when they were undergoing a ton of injuries. He's he's currently firmly entrenched behind second year player Ryan Ryan Vandermark is the primary backup offensive tackle, and that's not great, right? Because I went to Pro Football Focus and I looked at his like where he's taken reps historically. He didn't play for a couple seasons, and when he has, he has primarily been a right tackle. Yeah, 2022, last time he played. Right tackle, all 100 of his snaps. Then you go back to 2021, and he had 83 at right tackle. And then you go back to 2020, and he had none. And then you go back to 2019, and he had 68 68 snaps or whatever this is. All at tackle. All late in the season is an injury replacement for somebody. So he's a veteran, and that's cool on paper. And this is why I hate, like, when you take a look at a 90-man roster and go, oh, man, they've got all these great players and they've got names because you recognize the name. There are men whose careers are at stake if this football team does not produce who are hedging their bets that Ryan Vandermark is more useful at this point in his career than Lyle Collins is as a backup tackle. That should tell you a lot about where, even though you're familiar with the name, where Lyle Collins is at this point in his career as a professional. His best bet to make the roster might be to kick inside the guard. And I don't know if, Chris, I don't know if they're going to give him that latitude to experiment with it. If the guy has only ever done one thing and he's, not the best person on your roster at it. How many backup tackles do you see them taking? Uh, pull up the R lads just for the sake of our conversation. Like, do you think that if this guy is a third tackle going into the preseason games, what's his upshot of actually making the roster? Uh, don't usually, well, if you were like a good tackle and then wear and tear, don't you move inside? Yeah, except he hasn't done that thus far in his career. Chris, scroll down there for me. Hit me with, uh, yeah, there we go. So you're looking at, yeah, see, they already, they've already they already shuffled this, and he's not listed as the backup left guard over at ourlads.com. That's probably where he needs to be if he wants to make the roster. But there again, they may look at some of these younger, more athletic guys and go, that's the guy. That's what we want. We don't, we don't need a Lyle Collins. So even though it's early in the process, if you want to talk about biggest losers, that guy's already falling behind. Now, you want to talk about biggest losers, one of them is sitting in the room with me, and here's why, folks. I know, I I follow social media, and so many of you guys enjoy defensive coordinator Bobby Babich's swag, his, 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 the drip that he approaches the podium with. Those are two words that I'll never use unironically in my own life. I just won't. I refuse. But... It's hilarious that everybody's going, oh, man, look at look at Bobby Babbage. Look at his swag. And here comes Chris, a salty ass Chris Krueger on a Sunday morning <laughs> to declare over at Rock Pop Report on Twitter. Go follow us if you're not already to declare that Babbage is dressed for ladies night at Caputi's in Tonawanda with his gold chain, almost flat brim hat. I've never, <laughs> I've never been to Caputi's in Tonawanda. I know you have, so that hit home. That would hit home to you and somebody like a Dave Kateris, who probably is a legend at Caputi's. This is what I love. There are people who don't understand that sometimes Chris will tweet something, knowing that I will eventually see it and react to it personally. It's it's like instead of texting me something, Chris will just send a tweet that's intended to irritate me. So it's like a time release thing where he can do it now. And four hours from now, I'm going to send him a message and go, I'll see you in hell. Or I'll be like, that's hilarious. Awesome. There's no way that that tweet irritated you. No, at all. I it, it was one of those moments where when, you, you know, people respond, LOL. I laughed out loud. I belly laughed because 
So one of my softball teams when we were playing in Amherst decided that it would be a good idea. They go, oh, man, where are we going to go for our who, who are we going to have for a bar sponsor this year? Who should we approach? And I left the older guys. I left it up to them. And the result was they go, well, you know, it'll be cool. And the younger guys will get a kick out of this. We'll go to Caputi's near the boulevard in Tonawanda. We'll go to Caputi's because it's ladies night. Like the, the, a lot of them are still single because they're all in their like mid 20s, early 20s. This will be a blast. There'll be girls there. It'll be a good time, blah, blah, blah. What they didn't kind of, kind of calculate in all of this is that ladies night just brings out the local like it's almost like you emptied a trailer park into that place because everybody's going hunting for a honey. And so there's probably 15 girls in this bar and 47 guys wearing skin tight affliction T-shirts and chains with flat brim hats on. They all looked exactly like Bobby Babbage did in his presser. <laughs> Here I am, sweaty, dirty. You're, you're running around playing softball. I'm in shorts and like a jersey and I'm belly to belly trying to get a drink at the bar with 15 guys all buying shots of hypnotic as if that didn't go out of style back in like the like mid aughts. Like it's, it's chaos. You that one tweet took me back to a chapter of my life. You know what? Jessica and I had a conversation uh, over the weekend about like. This is so much fun that we have each other and we don't have like we're, we're not like trying to date in our 40s. And I'm, I'm like, there's no way like if I beat every dating app, because that's the <laughs> only thing that works for me. <laughs> I, I can't yes. <laughs> I can't imagine ever calling Drew or texting Drew and going Come out with me <laughs> to the cove on transit <laughs> so I can I can try to find a lady. A lady I in her 40s? Yeah, I don't have to do that anymore. Yeah, dating at this point in time, man, like I'm looking, I'm not putting down my single. Yes. <laughs> this is going to become a bit. There's nothing wrong with having to date in your 40s, right? It happens to some people. D people die. People get divorced. People split up. It just – life gets weird. The one thing I will say is that I know I don't have it in me. I'm not doing it. My wife and I have had this conversation. I was joking with her the other day about how if I fell off the roof while I was fixing something, if I fall and that's it, well, the life insurance is going to pay out double indemnity because it was an accident. And you'll be able to afford a new husband with much better teeth. You'll move into a better neighborhood. You'll you'll get more dogs. You'll buy a new husband and it'll be fine. To which she really – so this started a kind of funny back and forth conversation between us. And she goes, well, I know if I something were to happen to me, you would, you know, you would stay single forever. And I said, absolutely correct. And she goes, no, haha, that's funny. But no. And I was like, no, no. You are 100% correct because I don't have the patience anymore. I don't have the patience to deal with another human being. Like, this is it. I've, I've hitched my wagon. If this doesn't work, Chris, I'm done. Oh, man. If you're if Larissa died, I'll 100% go with you to the cove to get some dumpster mermaids. <laughs> dumpster mermaids. Listen, it's called cougar hunting, and it's, it's not you all. You don't it's, cougar hunt at the cove. And it's not all it's cracked up to be. With that said, Bobby Babbage's uh, sense of style notwithstanding, I do like the things he has to say. I, 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 I'm, I'm enjoying the energy he's bringing to practice. You know, there's multiple clips of him out there meandering around after plays, like talking to this guy, talking to that player. He's coaching in the moment with these guys, and you can see because he's been around, he's not a stranger, right? So there's no break-in period where the players have to try to get used to him or his personality or his coaching style. Now that he has a little bit more seniority and he has more of a global view of the defense rather than just, hey, I work with this position. You're watching players respond to that. All these little video clips where they're like, here's Babbage out there with energy out there working with the guys, getting them fired up. He's talking to this player about the mistake he made on a rep. And, and you, you want to see that. Because that's the natural evolution of building a coaching staff when you've lost so many people over the years because you're successful, right? Yeah. 
So this has been really encouraging to see, and hopefully it continues. A little bit of a negative note. It's been noted, okay? I know I'm saying noted too many times. I'm already hearing it in my head, and I'm thinking, Drew, you horse's ass, knock it off. You're supposed to be a professional. I haven't even had anything to drink yet. Just a beer and a Monte Carlo. I don't count the drink if I'm not finished with it. Is that growing on you? It is. That whatever this floor, whatever this thing is. Benedictine. This is going to be like Velvet Flarenum and I'm going to feel like a weirdo going into the, walking into the liquor store and when someone goes, oh, hi, how can I help you? I'm here for Velvet Flarenum. You almost say it like you're, it would be, I buy Velvet Flarenum and things like called Benedictine the way I think guys would buy tampons for their significant other where you just like, you're browsing and you're looking and you don't know what you're looking for or where you don't even know what the bottle looks like. You're like, I don't, I don't know what any of this is. And someone walks up trying to help you and you're literally embarrassed to say, say it out loud. Like I'm, I'm here. I'm here for the thing. <laughs> when I, well, when I go to liquor stores now, I am Ron Swanson at Lowe's. Hey, is there a problem? <laughs> I know more than you. I know more than you. <laughs> that's, I love it. So one of the things that's been noted is that Allen and Connor McGovern, it's, it's, things aren't bad. Obviously, the offense is the offense is moving, but there's been some instances of some botch snappery. There's some missed shotgun snaps. There's low, specifically low shotgun snaps. Again, you're talking about Connor McGovern, who hasn't done the the duties of an acting center in what I think since like high school, college, high school, college. So it's been a few years since he's had to do this. So maybe it's just him knocking the rust off. Everything's still moving. The offense hasn't tanked. I don't, you know, it's nothing to scream to the hills about, but at the same time, it's worth noting that that's the type of thing that right now you need to work on. Like I want to, I want to hear reports that they got together and just worked the hell out of that because Chris, you when, when the preseason rolls around and you start inserting backup offensive linemen and you want to experiment with Ryan Vandemark out there at left tackle, you know what I don't need? I don't need Connor McGovern to throw a ball in the dirt that causes Allen to have to take more time behind less than starting offensive linemen and potentially risk a hit or two. Is this going to go to the uh, the old McDerm- the old McDermott way of? Uh... I'm not going to play rookies unless they're absolutely needed. Because <laughs> at what point are you going to give Van Pran Granger a shot at this? If this continues for well, more days, you're going to have to turn to the guy. I don't think you will, because it turns out Van Pran Granger is having some growing pains of his own. <laughs> He's having some. It's it, nothing terrible, but also nothing that makes you think that in a pinch they wouldn't go to Will Clapp. If for no other reason than he has more experience and he's actually done it in a live game, I don't know that VPG would be the first one to get that call. <laughs> Just say it. So, all of those things, some of them good, some of them bad. Just quick hitters. I wanted to get all the negativity, though, that I could out. And I wanted to finish on this, Chris. If you want to queue up a drop for me here. The biggest loser out of everybody for the first week of NFL training camp are the people who are scalping what were free tickets to camp. You folks fell on your face. You get an F minus in my book. You people are disgusting. You make me sick. I I get it, right? Like, if you want to go out there and try to say, hey, you know, I I got these tickets and I can't use them and I'm going to give them away. Like, I've seen a lot of that. And I've tried to repost on social media platforms as many people trying to offer up free tickets that they had that they either couldn't use or that they got thinking they could go and couldn't or that they just got and are trying to be charitable and trying to give them away to people who wanted to. Because for Chris, this might be as close to NFL football as some people get this year. Right. Yes, you have to factor in. There are people because, like, Fernonia, we had shit in Fernonia for a while. So you're going to be able to get people that get to watch the game from Erie, mm-hmm. have it in Rochester. Now you're getting people in from Syracuse. But also, they're going to get in. They may there. not have the wherewithal, especially people with kids, may not have the ability 
to drag their kids to the stadium on a Sunday and then try to get home, depending on their age. Like, maybe it's something you want to share with your kids like I did with my son, Jack. Maybe when he's two and a half, almost three years old, and you want to take him and just let him run. You don't even care about practice. You just want to go let him be close. to Like this Friday, the, the return of the blue and red. At Highmark Stadium. Last year, I took my oldest son. This year, I'm taking both of my boys. They're four and two. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to let them run the concourse. I'm going to watch about 10 minutes of practice. And I'm going to take them to go see where I'm going to take them, Chris, to my seats. And I'm going to show them this is where dad is on Sundays when he's here. And I'm going to take them to the gift store and we're going to buy some stuff. And I'm going to let them run around and eat concession food that's overpriced and terrible. But it doesn't matter because it's part of the experience. Because I want to be able to, I want them to be able to look back and go, hey, they bulldozed that place. But that place was really special to dad and he was there. And I got to do that with him. There's people who want to take their children and come do this thing with their kids and be close to it and share it and kind of grow the game that way where their kids get, I don't want to say indoctrinated because that has negative connotations to it, but (laughs) their kids get involved at the same time in order to do this on a week to week basis, Chris, you left me an envelope that literally just says seasons on it. And I know what's in here. Do you know what it is? It's money. It's cash for this year's season tickets. There's not everybody who just has an envelope of cash that they can set aside and go, Oh yeah, I'll buy that on a lark. And so in this way, training camp represents their best ability to put themselves and their family close to the game of football, bring their kids up in it, get kind of foster that interest that they might have in it because they go down for autographs after practice and they go, that player was really cool. I'm going to root for him. Or they're, if they're lucky enough to get to give Josh Allen a high five and it, it makes their entire life like that. You don't get those moments everywhere. You get it at training camp. That's why they give these things away for free is because they're trying to get more people in. And so I think it's absolutely disgusting that there's people out there who would take that and then try to resell those for a profit. And when I say a profit, I'm not talking about like, oh, yeah, like I'll give them to you for 10 bucks. There were people out there trying to scalp these things for like 40, 50, 60 dollars a piece. Chris, if I f- if. <laughs> I've asked multiple people, I go, screenshots, just send me screenshots. I'll figure the rest out. The, the, like the feeling in my chest becomes like vigil. It's like f- vigilante justice forward. Like I want to do something terrible when I see stuff like this. Maybe there's a rock pile report, like reality show in here where we like Chris Hansen just show up and confront these people on camera with those Bluetooth mics you bought. What we do, here's what, here's what you do. So you go out for training camp. We go to, I don't know, do they have tops in Rochester? I hope not. Because if, I mean, tops is terrible. Tops, tops as a that, chain should be contained like the flu. Yeah. Well, if I'm saying that supermarket, because we all know that supermarket is garbage. And we just go in your truck. We collect shopping carts. And we find these people and we just zip tie shopping carts to all four or five door handles that we can. Now, I like I like my idea. In fact, I think next summer I'm going to put this into practice. If anybody and I want for the rest of the summer, if anybody sees people advertising on social media that they're selling training camp tickets, let me know at Rock Power Report on Twitter. Chris, what's our IG handle? The Rockpile Report on yeah. IG. We we get these. We hire a private investigator. We use money that Blue Wire gives us. We hire a private investigator. Find out these people's addresses, and then Chris, you do know I was a former skip tracer for the bank, and I used to recover like missing quote unquote or like, hey, you took our car. I'll find it and I'll find you. Try and hide from me. It was my favorite part of the job. To be honest, I liked it when people ran rather than gave it to me. I was like, oh, yeah, here we go. Give him a cat and mouse. Trust me, I, I don't need a private investigator. We're good. <laughs> I smell a web series here, guys. I'm just saying, let me and Chris work through the nuts and bolts. If you see people doing it, see something, say something at Rock Report or the Rock Report on Instagram. 
<sighs> now on to actual football conversation. There's been no Gable Stevenson updates, Chris. People have been actively trolling us ever since my Gable Stevenson hot takery from last week, but they're struggling to find mentions of the guy or video or photos. Here's my shock face. <gasps> It's the dumbest thing in the world. Chris, in a bookmarked tweet from Thad Brown over at WHAM. Okay. I'm looking at it here. Here's what he had to say. Okay. Notes from the first offensive line, defensive line, 1v1 in pads. Steven, Stevenson, not too shabby for our first time. He got into Anderson's pads a bit. Oh, boy. Is that not... He got into his pads a bit. Chris, click Alec Anderson. Just click the name. I want to see when he came into the NFL. What position is he? Right there. Right by your cursor. Go up one. Alec Anderson. I want to see this. So, offensive tackle, playing into your offensive line here, out of UCLA. Scroll up. Okay, so... He was a undrafted for a college free agent. He has two years of NFL experience. This being his second season, he was uh, he came out in 2022. Actually, no, so this makes his third year of experience. So he's been on and off the Bills practice squad, waved, reactivated, waved, kind of hung around. Chris, he got into his pads. <laughs> Not not an ounce of leverage, not in, because you know that if he had, if he had made any positive strides, they would have said that, right? Right there. This is our Instagram. <laughs> I clipped out you talking about Gable Stevenson as a PR gimmick. 13,200 views on Instagram right there. And people are mad at me for it. They're like, oh, this, this is it. First of all, again, what somebody the, said, the kids say this is an L take. Yeah, I don't know what that means. And I also don't read your comments. So k k I guess you can leave them. I don't have to care. You don't read the comments because you don't have access to our Instagram. That's that. But somebody, I did tell you, somebody wrote L take. And like, as if this guy thinks Stevenson's going to make the team. It's hilarious. He's never, he's never played football before. Dean Kindig. Dean Kindig from Buffalo fan base wrote a report that he watched Stevenson catch the absolute business from, from Osiris Torrance in 1v1s. He goes, they locked horns and he got shoved backwards about five yards. <laughs> That's what you should be expecting when you take a guy who doesn't matter how athletic he is. You're an undersized, world-class athlete trying to go up against guys who have played a game knowing the technique for their entire lives. You should get manhandled. That should be the expectation. You should see a guy like that get chumped. And I'm happy it happened. Because that is a wake-up call for every single person who doesn't understand how technical it is to try to block it's like, oh, he's a big dude. He should remember, Chris, what was that guy when they took a, oh, my God, the Bills, like, I want to say this maybe even predates Rex Ryan, when they took this giant, like, 360-pound player and tried to pivot him to offensive line or offensive line and tried to make him a D-tackle. I don't know, but we had this, like, mammoth football player. Lorenzo no Alexander? No. <laughs> I hate you. He beat you. Remember the time you tweeted about him? And then he just like jumped in. Do you, <laughs> Lorenzo? Don't don't talk about Lorenzo Alexander. He'll come find you. Do you have a date you want me to look up on our lads? Oh God, go! It doesn't matter. Well, what I'm what I'm going to say. If someone out there, if you know, call, call in. in. <laughs> call in if you know who this behemoth of a lineman that could play both ways apparently was, and we tried using him. Being big, having physicality doesn't matter if you don't get technique, and if you don't have size or technique, then you get bullied. And it's going to continue happening. And I don't know. I expect to hear more of this. In fact, it makes me ask a couple questions, Chris. Knowing that he's getting roughed up with no pads on, like they're not even going full tilt, like full contact practices and stuff like that. What's going to happen when that ramps up here in the next week? Yeah. 
<laughs> or a uh, first preseason game. Well, I was going to ask, is there a chance they don't let him play in the preseason? I'm, maybe. Is there a chance that when the bullets start flying, he's so low on the totem pole, he doesn't actually get to participate? <laughs> healthy scratch? I don't know of a healthy scratch. I just don't think they let him see the field. I think he maybe gets five snaps, and they just hope nothing bad happens to him. It's going to be really interesting to see. Here's what I know. When that kicks off, they have the potential to create the most, like, Chris, they're going to make NFL comedy that we haven't seen since the day in the preseason when Buffalo Bills linebacker, who was a complete bust, Voshan Joseph, he was like 230 pounds, made Carolina's second round pick at left tackle, Greg Little, literally slide like he was on roller skates and fall down sideways while doing a split. <laughs> Remember Russ Brown being like, he's just not that good. <laughs> and you clipped it with that sound in the background and you're like, this is it. Yeah. He's just not that good. <sighs> now on a positive note, cause it can't just all be shit talking. One of the bigger talking points coming into camp was the pass catcher group and how much of the NFL media is declaring that this has to be a step back for the Buffalo bills this year because we've t changed some offensive linemen. We've shuffled some things around and ultimately we lost Stephon Diggs, so obviously our passing game has to take a giant step backwards. Not just a small step, but a significant step backwards. I mean, you've got all the talking heads out there. Emmanuel Acho, who we know, he's just a hot take machine. But he's out here saying, oh, like, this is going to be the worst season they've had in five years. <laughs> I don't know. That passing game in 2019, Chris, wasn't exactly the reason we were winning games, huh? Yeah. So, with that in mind... <sighs> I take a look at this, and there was a tweet that I saw from Brett Coleman that really kind of changed. First of all, it speaks to some of what we're seeing here with the Buffalo Bills. It goes, I understand that having an elite receiver is very important, and the top five to six guys are definitely worth the money. But also, please do remember that the average amount of snaps that teams face versus true man coverage is about 25%. The vast majority of plays any offense runs are going to be against zone looks, whether it's match zone or spot drop. And truth be told, getting open against those kinds of looks has always has way more to do with football IQ, instinct, and timing with the quarterback than just pure separation ability and physical skills. People like to say all the time that it's a quarterback and receiver league, but it's really a quarterback and offensive line league. Those are the two position groups that truly have a major effect on the outcome of every down and distance, regardless of what the defense is calling. That is probably one of the most salient takes you'll get, and that's why I love Brett. Like, he's like, look, guys, you can get all enamored with wide receiver talent. In a vacuum, they don't matter. Like, they matter in a vacuum, I should say backwards. In a vacuum, they matter. If you're just comparing this wide receiver skill set to that wide receiver to this receiver, but that's not how football gets played. Football, you have to account for the line giving the quarterback time to operate, the quality of the quarterback, and the makeup of the scheme. And if those things are all in sync, then you can take fairly pedestrian wide receivers and make them useful. Not world beaters, but you can make them useful. That's why I'm optimistic about what a lot of people have been saying about the pro you know, projection of the passing game and all these things, especially if the offensive coordinator can do some of the heavy lifting schematically to create situations for the wide receivers and quarterbacks to thrive. Now, if you've listened to this podcast for the last nine years, you'll know I have not been a fan of most of our play callers, right, Chris? 100%. But it is an opportunity to make this happen. Update here. Yeah. Pretty Ricky. 213 on Twitter. Yeah. Who has broken some shit. Yeah. And like beaten your Schefters and your yeah. Rappapores. Uh, this this tweet went out probably just before we press record. CD Lamb, four year extension around 136 to 138. So wide receivers. go. So wide receivers getting paid. And here's the Bills and Chiefs divesting of expensive things and going, hey, listen, we'll be at the bottom of the depth chart for who pays wide receivers. We still think we can win because we think we have the offensive coordinating talent and we think we have the talent under center. 
and we think we have the line and we can dictate play. And that's how you make up for it. Like that's all the NFL is, is where do you want to put – it's a balancing act and the ones who do it the best or who have the best pieces that tip the scale in their favor, there's not a lot you can do to overcome them. What I'll say is that I'm hearing all the right things when it comes to the, the offense, the structure of our offense. I mean, Shakir being called the most consistent wide receiver. Samuel working with wide receivers and running backs, being used in a ton of motion, whether it's jet sweeps, you know, pre-snap checks just to come across the formation and go back to see if anyone moves. All of these things, just being the guy that we signed to a multi, excuse me, signed to a multi-year contract, not just like a one or two year flyer with void years that we signed a bunch of these guys to. Allen himself has praised Mac Hollins who's making a lot of catches and he's showing chemistry already. And then you got Tyrell Shavers, who's this, I, I crapped all over him earlier in the uh, preseason process. He's a slow undrafted free agent out of Alabama at six foot four. He's just a behemoth who's been showing off previously unseen versatility because now he's lining up at every single wide receiver position slot. Right boundary, left boundary, which means that he must have done a ton of study last offseason and into this offseason of just the the playbook. What do you want from me? Try to refine what technique I can. He's showing out and they're giving him opportunities. I was going to praise Mac Collins on his uh, nail cutting ability because I do the same thing. I'll do it outside. Just like Mac Hollins. I hate you. I like him. <laughs> I hate you. And then Keon Coleman. Now, I know you laughed earlier. Best Bills Bet wide receiver he's in history. He's the greatest. That's all. This is all Twitter has told me. He had a catch uh, in, in the end zone on the sideline. It was the greatest catch in the, in the history of football that we've ever seen. So. Hey. Hey. Yeah. But he's making catches. Do you know what Gabe Davis is doing right now? <laughs> I have not seen I have not seen a Gabe Davis update. Gabe Davis update. this morning. Gabe Davis update. He beats Trey Flowers on a route in practice. They put the ball. It's right on his hands. <gasps> and he dropped. <laughs> and Jaguars fans are in shambles. <laughs> it couldn't happen to a nicer group of people. No, I don't have any ill will towards Gabe Davis. I just think it's hilarious that like he leaves for this giant contract. He's in training camp. They're like, what? why is this guy dropping so many balls? It's like, we tried to tell you. We tried to warn you of this. What, what, have you been living under a rock? He got paid for that uh, 99 yard touchdown pass against the Steelers that you missed because <laughs> you weren't in the seats. I think the best part is I'm not emotionally married to any of these guys. This Yet. is the first time in a long time that I am emotionally detached from our entire wide receiver depth chart. And like maybe the knowing what we have and just kind of the structure of things and the dynamic Brett laid out is kind of why I don't care. Like reports at a camp that Marvis Veldez Scantling hasn't really been impressive. He's he's spent time with the second and third team units. Like, I don't know if he's in the coach's doghouse. I don't know if there's something about him that they just don't like. But that doesn't sound like the way you would treat a guy who you expect to make the roster, right? Yeah. Like, especially if there's bigger, more physical wide receivers out there who can do more versatile things and you know that your offense is going to need the running game. So with that in mind, like, I see this and I see what's going on. I mean, MVS could make the team. I'm not saying he won't. We're only a week in. It's too early for that kind of hot takery. But what I will say is that we've seen them do crazier shit. Like everyone goes, oh, $2.5 in dead money. They won't cut MVS. They let OJ Howard take $3 million, go sit on a beach for two months, and then play for Cincinnati. That played for Houston. Houston, since it doesn't fucking matter, they had a good quarterback. He went to go find a, a just as good of a situation as he would have had here in Buffalo, and we paid him to do it. It's awful. <sighs> 
I will say, though, that their handling of MVS so far kind of underscores the fact that there's a message being sent here. It all, it's almost like they don't care about your pedigree. They don't care about your production. This, the, 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 whatever you've done on paper doesn't matter. It's this offense with this quarterback. You know, and if you have that, you've got a spot and you'll see opportunities. And if you don't, then I don't know what to tell you. And it's interesting that guys like Hollins and guys like Samuel are being talked about. Tyrell Shavers is getting like he's getting ink in all the papers. MVS is nowhere to be found. I don't know. I don't want him near my football team. Now, if you recall last week, Anthony Prohaska from Cover One was in studio here with us. And when we talked about the wide receiver competition, which which we agreed was probably for one roster spot because we were both doing the thing, right? Like we were doing the thing most Bills fans were doing and see, taking a look at the contract, taking a look at MVS's pedigree and going, well, we'll write his name in here with pen instead of pencil, which might have been a mistake. But. It turned into a conversation about the fact that, well, talent matters in the NFL. Like, that's the reason everybody's down on us. Scheme and usage is also important, especially when it comes to the makeup of the 2024 Buffalo Bills. You can go traditional, like, wing-wing looks where Kincaid and Knox are attached to the formation on either side or hipped off of one another. You can have them lined up in more your traditional, like, heavier type of looks. Or you can go spread and go two by two gun and have Kincaid in a slot and Knox in a slot. Or you can go trips to one side and Kincaid is the basically the X receiver on the side by himself. Then you could do the exact same thing with your 11 personnel grouping. If you take an 11 personnel grouping up, which means you have three receivers, of Keon Coleman, Mac Hollins, MBS, Keon Coleman, Khalil Shakir, Curtis Samuel, all these things, you can go obviously spread and you can go gun and empty and do all these things you want to do. Or... You can go with condensed formations because guess what? Your bigger bodied, physical, athletic receivers can also function as run blockers. And that's where you put a defense into a bind because now the defense, when they, it, I'm sure everyone knows, I don't think what I'm about to say is revelatory, but you see a personnel grouping coming in. So the guys up in the box are like, up oh, there, they're, you know, they're bringing in 13 personnel, take out our nickel corner, let's bring in another linebacker, or a big nickel or a safety or something. You're trying to match personnel on personnel. But now, you have to hope if you're a defense that you have a nickel that's physical enough and sound enough in the run and also in coverage <laughs> to function against 11 personnel who can actually be receivers or 12 personnel in the run or 12 personnel in the pass, 11 personnel. There you go, Anthony Prohaska, last week on this very show. So it's interesting when you hear them talk about it, right? Go back and listen to the whole conversation if you haven't. So... Basically, we go on to, in that discussion, talk about how this dynamic and how you create mismatches is kind of the backbone of some of the best offenses in football right now, specifically ones that use bigger bodied and maybe lesser heralded wide receivers like the Lions. Amon Ross St. Brown gets a lot of he gets a lot of shine. Chris, can you name the other wide receivers on the Lions depth chart? Just off the top of your head. Calvin Johnson. Who's Charles Rogers? <laughs> Anybody else? Seriously, out of is there a one as a lay fan that you think got you can... it? Brandon Pettigrew. Brandon Pettigrew. I remember when they drafted Pettigrew. Going, didn't they just draft a tight end in the first round like a year ago? Oh no, 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 no! Pettigrew was the first one, and then they took who's that guy who's now playing for the uh, or last was playing for the Steelers as I knew. I don't know. That's it. Guys, the Ravens and Lions, I think, have put it like showed why if you don't feel like using your tight end as a wide receiver the way the Bills are, it's a waste. Donovan Peoples Jones. Donovan Peoples Jones. That's a real answer. I Kal know it is. Khalif Raymond. And that's hilarious. Sam Laporta. Yeah, you don't know any of these guys. I'm reading them off the I know screen. you are, and that's why it's funny to me. Like, you don't know, you didn't know about any of these guys' existence. Jameson Williams, I'm a, I know about, right? But if you went back to what their offense was last year, if I go on our ledge and I look at who their starting wide receivers were in October, it's one of those things of like Marvin's Jones Jr., Josh Reynolds, and Amon Ross St. Brown. And that's why Josh Reynolds is interesting to me, right? It's a team using bigger bodied, 
lesser known players and just what you do using condensed formations is you use them and their big bodies to your advantage to create versatility and mismatch opportunities, right? You don't need superhuman plays from your wide receiver core if your scheme and the way that you're using them and the way that the opposing defenses, to Anthony's point, not a lot of teams have a guy who they're willing to say, hey, I'm going to leave a nickel corner against Keon Coleman one-on-one. Or even if it's zone, it doesn't matter. That's his zone, and I'm going to ask a five foot eight guy to go cover Coleman. That's a bad idea. So it, you're forcing the, uh, the defensive coordinator's hand. They're trying to watch how they line up against you, and they go, all right, well, we're seeing some things, right? And I'm already looking at Anthony's, t- like Anthony's been tweeting throughout training camp as he's been attending it the other day. There's a three by one formation. So they're an 11 personnel, but their 11 personnel are Shakir is the one, Kincaid is the two, Knox is the three, Keon Coleman is the X receiver, and Curtis Samuel is the running back. If you're a defensive coordinator, what do you do in that position? Because you go, well, they could go empty and just have an empty set, and now everybody on my defense has to pass protect. Or what they could be doing, they could motion him out, but then they could run the ball with Samuel. Or what they could do is they could tighten the field and shrink it down. And they could then run these bunch formation plays where I don't know where they're going. And if they decide to pave a way for Samuel and he finds a crease, I don't know what can happen to me. You can do all of these things with the same personnel because even though Mac Hollins and Dawson, you know, Keon Coleman out there is the X, or if you wanted to put Mac Hollins in that conversation, or if you want to say Tyrell Shavers can go out there and do that job. Or, God forbid, they decide that, what's his face, Uh, Justin Shorter. They go, Justin Shorter's having a phenomenal run. We're going to go give him a crack at this. All you're seeing as a coordinator is a big wide receiver coming out, and you go, well, he's still a wide receiver. He can catch the ball. It's his primary function. So I can't just put a blocker on him. I have to put somebody who can also cover, and that limits my ability to match up with their size. That's that's it. That's like to so to think about it philosophically is one thing to see them doing it. You know, right here back in the 20 yesterday, first 11 personnel play with the first team offense, Hollins, Coleman, Shakir, Kincaid. They're steering into we want size. We want size and physicality because that's what's going to pace our offense. I think that you're seeing a lot of passing right now in training camp, Chris. You're going to see a lot more when the regular season rolls around. They're going to get into these heavy formations, but it's heavy because there's what are labeled as wide receivers, but are the size of tight ends and have the ability to block. And God help you if you sell out on the run, because then we'll just pass the ball. And they're giving that to Josh Allen. Yeah, everyone's written and talked about his his leadership and how he's communicating with them and telling them what he wants. Wouldn't this seem like the perfect time if you have to make a pivot to where the quarterback at the line of scrimmage can make a decision? Whether, hey, we're going to go with a condensed formation that's going to line up between the hashes with all of these giant bodies. And then at the line, if I think that our odds are better with an audible, I can call it right then and there. And now the defense is screwed because they lined up to stop the run and we have multiple pass catchers out here. That's, I think if I have anything that is like a really positive takeaway from training camp so far, it's that dynamic right there. That's something that we postulated all offseason about that could be a possibility. The Bills are showing us that they're willing to steer into it. And it's something that isn't just a bunch of fans sitting at home drinking going, Hey, man, you know what play would really work, you know, when I'm nine beers deep yelling at the TV? Instead, what it is is a trend that's been exploited by most of the more successful offenses in the NFL right now. Makes sense. It's good to know that we're on that level at this point with the Bills in training camp and that they are they at least have a blueprint of how to take all these not household name skill position players and make them functionally useful. I'm not going to get too excited about it until I see it actually occur against another team. 
but the early returns just in the first week of training camp have me feeling pretty good about things. And then there's one other thing. Like, I was going to talk about the the defensive end 1-2 contest, and Chris, I even had a joke written here in my notes. As we predicted, as we predicted, mm-hmm. there is a, an official battle going on for who's going to be defensive end 2. Miller hasn't been taking that many snaps. Greg Rousseau's gotten the and here's and here's where I stand with the defensive end stuff through the first week. Greg Rousseau was named by uh, Joe Biscalia of the Athletic, the MVP of days one through three. Okay, that can cut a bunch of ways, right? On one hand, it can signal that Greg Rousseau has worked on his techniques and all the technical parts of how to be a pass rusher, and the, I mean, he was already good at run defense. And that he finally has aligned himself athletically and technically to have an improved pass rushing season. Because I think his last season in college, he had like 15 sacks, but everyone kept saying, oh, they're just cleanup sacks. He doesn't actually get his own. And that was that was one of the reasons he fell down draft boards. So with that in mind, it could mean that he's about to just take off. It could also mean that our offensive tackles are not ready yet, Chris. Like, they're still rusty. Like, everyone's ooing and eyeing over him beating, uh, I mean, his plays have mostly come on the right end. So he's going against um, uh, Spencer Brown. Spencer Brown, who just had shoulder surgery this offseason, is still working back from that, wearing a shoulder strap. I saw that over at bangedupbills.com. So when his website is back up and not undergoing routine maintenance, <laughs> when that's not happening, you can go there and read about that. But he's, it's like, oh, so you're winning against a guy who's rusty. And also who, because of the nature of what training camp is at this point, isn't allowed to give you his full physicality because you didn't have, you don't have all the pads on. It's finally up there. Yeah, there it is. Spencer Brown's short. Shoulder labrum tear. Yep. So he's working his way back and he's rusty and the, 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 you could also see it that way. <sighs> what I'll say is this, Chris, have you heard about any of the other defensive ends like of note? Like, hey, man, this guy made a crazy play. Just Gabe Stevenson. <laughs> That's the only one. What, for getting punked? <laughs> That could be problematic. Like that dynamic of that Rousseau's the only one being talked about could be an issue when the actual bullets start flying. But I do like the fact that Epinesa and Smoot are rotating in a defensive two, defensive end two, because we talked about it. I think that Von Miller could be one of the most effective defensive ends on the roster. I think his way to get there is to play less. I think the Bills need to find a way to survive with him being something of a specialist at this point in his career. You bring him in on important downs. You bring him in late in games. You bring him in, you you, you let him sit out, not sit out, but you give him limited snaps through the first half of a game against Kansas City. So you can bring him in in the third quarter when things are starting to get tight. And then you let him play in the fourth quarter in critical passing situations because you're going to have them. You're going to need that guy when things get tight. I mean, that's what we paid him for, right? Yeah. And even if you want to say, oh, he's washed and he's finished, him at half speed has accomplished more than AJ Epinesa ever has. So with that in mind, I think they would be smart to continue this trend of getting those younger guys involved more and more as the early down defensive end. And I'm really looking forward to seeing how that shakes out over the next couple weeks of camp heading into the preseason. And then lastly, a couple unheralded or overlooked defensive backs who are kind of dialing it up. First one being DeMar Hamlin. When we talked about the state of the safety position, there was a lot of people who thought that by signing the free agents we did, we kind of gave ourselves insulation from, hey, we've at least got guys who know what they're doing. And then we draft Cole Bishop, and everyone goes, all right, yeah, we got this figured out, or at least we've got a good shot at having really good depth. Did you have Hamlin having a really good camp on your bingo card? 
I didn't. I was actually surprised that he got a. Uh, what was it first day he got first team reps? Yeah, I didn't see that one coming. Now, here's why I think, and I think that we as fans need to kind of reset our expectations. Go back to 2016 before Sean McDermott got here. Do you know what the last safety group we had was? Off no. the top of your head, can you think of it? No. Aaron Williams and Corey Graham. And then Bakari Rambo after the cheap shot from Jarvis Landry, who I don't care. I, I don't know where Jarvis Landry is. I don't know what he's doing in life. I just hope that that guy gets parking tickets everywhere for the rest of his life. That was a scumbag hit no matter what way you cut it, and I'll never forgive him for it. In any event, he ruined Aaron Williams' career. Our season with Rex Ryan as coach just fell apart, as it seemed to do. He gets fired, and they bring in Poyer, Hyde, Colt Anderson, Shamil Gary, and Bakari Rambo. That's who we were in training camp with as our safety room. And they got rid of Duke Williams. Let's not yeah. forget that. Well, do you remember what Duke Williams is like the only thing he was ever noteworthy for? Mia Khalifa. He tried to climb into Mia Khalifa's DMs and she goes, he goes, yo, I'm a Buffalo Bill. She goes, I'm a Buffalo Bill. And she goes, what the hell is a Buffalo Bill? You can't make that up. Chris, if you get burned like that, don't you have to just deactivate all your social platforms? Yeah, you can never get back on. You can't. You you just log off forever at that point. Yo, I'm a Buffalo Bill. What is a Buffalo Bill? And you find out that the average person doesn't give a shit about this. <laughs> so with that in mind, the bar was set really low for that early 2017 when Sean McDermott first got here. That early safety group to come in and make an impact. And if you look at it, neither of Poyter Hire, Jesus Christ, did I screw that up? Hyde and Poyter, beers, folks. Neither of them was given starter money. Poyer got four years. I'm looking at it right now, 13 million with only 7 million guaranteed. His AAV would have been at the bottom of the league for all starters. Hyde got 30 million for five years. 14 guaranteed because he was at least a, a returner and a starting like cornerback for a team. Right now, today, top of the market safeties are getting guarantees over $30 million. So no one thought these guys were going to be great. They just brought in guys who they liked their athleticism, they liked their football IQ, and they were willing to roll the dice. Sean McDermott believed in this. He watched tape. He talked to Brandon Bean. Brandon Bean said, listen, we've been scouting these guys for, as a pro personnel person for a while. We like them. We think they'd fit your scheme. Here we go. Let's marry up and see what happens. And the rest is history. The reality is this is a safety and cornerback driven scheme, but it's also very friendly to those positions. And as a result, what you've got is a bunch of guys over the years who, I don't know, were just regarded as also Rams, who were able to come in here and find success. You know, Dane Jackson, Levi Wallace, Dean Marlowe. I'm thinking about Josh Norman. Josh Norman had one all pro Pro Bowl year, signed a lucrative contract and was still a good player, but wasn't elite when he left Carolina and left Sean McDermott. But it was the idea that we found out how to make you as a late round draft pick useful because we tailor the system to this type of thing. You just have to be smart enough and know how to get to where I want you to be. And that's it. You don't have to be a physical freak. You don't have to be a first round physical grade for the NFL draft. What you have to be is smart. And you got to be able to get to the spot and play with a little physicality. That's what they do. And they bring these guys in and they do it again and again and again. So I think that the doubt that's being cast on this group with all these off-season departures, Hyde, Poyer, Trey White, I don't think it comes from a lack of inability to do the lack of ability to do the job. I think it comes from a lack of familiarity with fans. Is that fair, Chris? Yeah. Okay. Hamlin and Rap have the most familiarity with the scheme, with the team, with the coaching staff, and thus they should look the best right now. And so it's not surprising that Hamlin is grabbing this opportunity and standing out. And I think that his bid to get a starting job just got made that much stronger by Mike Edwards catching that injury. I think that Hamlin, if he continues to play well, but there again, 
what is well, Chris. You're going up against Josh Allen in a practice setting. What happens when they put you should, in theory, shine when they put you up against a lesser quarterback, correct? Yes. I think the the pre I, I don't think camp is going to tell us it. I think the preseason is going to tell us what Hamlin is. But I think it's worth noting that the safety group, you think about how bad things got when we were without Poyer. And remember that stat? Like 2022, we lost every game that Poyer didn't start. That makes sense. Because we lost uh, Hyde right at the beginning of the year. Like week two, he was just done for the season. It was the home opener. So with that, we're a long way from there. But I think that the talents we have on hand, I love Hamlin's upside. I love the promise. I like the fact that he's showing some physicality, you know, past breakups. He's in the right place at the right time. He's showing that he's built some instinct as far as what this offense is. Some of that might be, though, you're just playing the same offense that you've known now for three years. So we're not going to know whether he can grab a hold of this until the real football starts getting played. He's a guy I'm going to have my eye on when the preseason rolls around. And then there's Kyrie Elam. New coach, new opportunity. He's gotten the chance to play. He's getting run with the ones, and he's making plays. Interceptions for touchdowns. He's making pass breakups. He's making tackles. His physicality was never in question. It was always just, do you understand how to play our zone-heavy system? Rasul Douglas stepped in and did it seamlessly. I think that Elam could be a player who benefits the most from the coaching staff changes than I think of anybody on the defense, whether it's Babbage taking over as coordinator, whether it's new position coaches stepping in. I think Elam is probably the player who's going to benefit the most through this preseason process from just having a new position coach and a new life at earning a position. And I think that that... It speaks to the flexibility of McDermott's scheme. And so for all the people upset that Trey White's no longer here, this defense can still be very, very potent without needing an all-pro, pro-bowl talent at corner. Because, Chris, we didn't have that when Sean McDermott showed up here in 2017 and made this team a winner, did we? No. Camp has been fun. There's a lot of cool developing storylines, and I can't wait to keep following and keep getting to show up here every week and talk to you people about it. But for tonight, I've rambled enough, and we got to get the hell out of here. I mean, this Narragansett is terrible. Chris? It's a definition of, a, of a, a empty calories. What nights are we going to be recording from now on? I don't know. I'm game. We can go back to Thursday. Guys, we're going to be rolling the dice. Chris has finally figured out his schedule. We're going to get back to a normal weekday recording schedule. We're going to go live. We're going to pick a night. We're going to be. We're going to figure this out and get it dialed in before the start of the regular season. I'm looking forward to it. Chris, more live content. You know you love that. Yeah, it is dialed in. <sighs> Guys, football's back. Football's back. That's all I have to say. Love it. Embrace it. Enjoy it because the losing hasn't started yet, right? Chris, everybody's still happy. Their foot, their football team is still Schrodinger's team. You don't know whether they suck or not. <sighs> Let's enjoy that for as long as we can. Until next week, guys. I'm Drew Gear. That's Chris Kruger. And this has been your Rock Pile Report.